Hello and welcome to episode 48 of Charlotte Mecklenburg History with Dan Morrill. Today is Sunday, February 5th, 2023, and I am Dan's daughter, Mary Dana, here with my dad after a long time, dad. You know? I'm still alive. I mean, yes. <laughs> I tell you, at my age, it's like walking up hill with a wind in your face every day, but I'm still here. God bless you. So I know the, the last time we did an episode was June 2021. Well, God bless it. I know. So it's been a while, but, but you yeah. know, I stayed persistent and here, here he is again. I got him to agree to do another episode. Finally, I'm so happy. Okay. So my dad, uh, Dan Morrill, he is... Um, a retired professor, history professor from UNCC, local historian. He is now currently uh, the administrative consultant for Preserve Mecklenburg. And today he is going to be talking about his approach to preservation and using the Knowlton Shaw House as an example. So, Dad, take it away. Well, you know, I'm not going to worry about going too long. Uh... I, it's your show. Yeah. You do what you want. Let me start out telling you a story. Okay. I had this reporter come to see me the other day. She wanted to talk about gentrification. That, that doesn't make any difference. Okay. And uh, she was a very nice person, very intelligent, no question about it. But um, she had been in Charlotte about four months. Mm -hmm. She was 27 years old. And of course, and it's an unfortunate aspect of being old, but when you're old and you're talking to a 27 year old, to be very nice about it, you're very aware of their level of experience in comparison to yours. But it was obvious that she and this is not her fault. She knew nothing about the history of Charlotte. It's just a new place on the map. She mm -hmm. had no sense. Now, you know, Charlotte is older than old Salem. Um, Charlotte was created in 1768. 1768. So it's an old place. And I think my approach to preservation is always to look at anything that we spend our time on or I spend my time on. Basically what it is, it's a way to teach history. It's not primarily a way to revitalize the neighborhood. It's not a way primarily to try to either promote or stop gentrification. It's not a way to try to make a lot of money. It's not a way to try to stimulate heritage tourism, even though none of those are bad things to do. It's primarily to teach history. And so when I ever become involved in a house like this house that you see before you, which is on Mecklenburg Avenue, and I know I've talked about it before. The very first thing I want to do is I want to find out about its history. Now, Mary Diana, you've been with me long enough. Lord God knows, poor woman. <laughs> long time. You know, the, you know the first thing I do when I meet anybody. You ask them where they're is, from. I want to ask them where they're from, what their background is, because... I understand everything historically. You know, where has it been? How's it evolved? And this house is a perfect example of the Charlotte House. First of all, those of you who want to do some newspaper research, I would strongly urge you to subscribe to a service called newspapers.com, N-E-W-S-P-A-P-E-R-S.com, newspapers, all one word. 
Now it's fairly expensive. I mean, it maybe it's I don't know. I don't know. Maybe a couple hundred dollars a year. But it is an invaluable tool because it has newspapers literally from all over the country. And if you want to pay more from all over the world, and you can type in whatever subject you want to or date you want to, you can just start searching newspapers. And the reality is that even to this day, uh, newspapers, daily newspapers are the most complete source for local history, day-to-day -day local history. Now, when I became involved with this house, which was in a designated historic landmark, the first thing I wanted to do was to find out if I could find out anything about who the architect was, or at least see what the basic construction of it was, what was original to it, what was not original to it. Well, I went into newspapers.com and I guessed that it was built, I'd done a little bit more research and I guessed it was built in 1928. So I went to the newspapers.com, went to the Charlotte newspapers and I was very fortunate to find published in that newspaper an actual construction of the house. It is under yeah. construction, and you can see the date is May 27th, 1928. And you know, we've dealt with this before, but there is nothing more golden to a researcher than having a verified historical event. It's like um, having a pen on a map. You know, you've got a place. You begin to sort of stick things together. Mm -hmm. And I want you to look particularly at the left side of the house. You can see they're partially building up uh, an extension on the left that's going to match the one on the right. And you can obviously see as well that this is a very traditional style house. This is what we would call colonial revival. You've got a little building on the right, which is essentially a garage, which is connected by a walkthrough so you don't get wet. It goes into the right side of the house, which is where I know the kitchen is. And of course, that's the house. Now, so, Many people, when they deal with preservation, they don't know the stories. Now, I'm not talking about first story, second story. I'm talking about the people who live there, who built it, why they built it, why did they come here, what were they about. Well, let me start putting that together for you a little bit. Now, here's the house. This picture was taken, in fact, I think the date's down there, but I can't see it. It was, you know, three or four years ago. It. <laughs> it's three or four years ago. Same house. Now, if somebody says, when was it built? I know it was built in 1928. Now, I know enough about Charlotte history to know that, and, and United States history, that 1928 was a blush year economically. The 1920s were a time, particularly in a city like Charlotte, where times were good. People could make money and people weren't making money. Now, I looked and looked and looked for a building permit. And... Um, the building permits, unfortunately, are never been digitized. The building permits are at the public library. Mm, I was going to ask, where did you look? And and uh, I have never been able to, when I did and looked and looked and looked, and believe it or not, I did find the building permit, and they did not fill in the line architect. Oh, 
sometimes when the guy filled out it, the sheet, sheet, he didn't fill it out completely. Maybe it wasn't a good day. Now, do you know the word infer? What it means when you infer something? Yes. You don't know, but you have a feeling. You can have some, you can draw an inference. I believe this house might have been built by a man named Bruce, excuse me, Boyce T. I'm sorry, Oscar T. O S C A R T H I E S. You remember the Griffin? We'll go back and talk about the Griffin. Yeah. Later. You know, you go, you go to, you go to the Walgreens up at 544 Providence Road. Like if you're going up Louise, looks like you're going to run right into it. You know, the one we go to all the time, right? Yeah. You know that. Well, that's where he grew up. He, grew, he didn't grow up in the drugstore, but that's where his house was. And his house got moved over to Orangeley. Mm -hmm. And if you go to that drugstore, <clears throat> on the far left side of the parking lot, it's a little sidewalk that goes through, you can walk through. And it goes over to the T's house. <clears throat> and the offices, gotta get me a little water here. The offices no for the Duke Mansion are in Mr. T's house. Now, I <laughs> think he might well have been the man because he would build traditional style houses for wealthy people. I'll have to try to find out and do some more research, but I'm trying. Now, I don't know who built it. I know when it was built. I know it's Colonial Revival. I think Oscar T's built it, okay? Now, what am I doing? I'm building the story, building the story, building the story of the house, okay? Now, let's let, I do know who built it. And I've got a picture of the woman. I don't have a big... <clears throat> well, let me tell you who built it. Well, who's that man's picture? Is that Oscar T's? Who is that? That's Oscar. That's, you got it, baby. Okay. You got it. You got it. That's Oscar T's. That's who we think was the architect. Yes. Okay. I think he had in-house designers in his real estate company. Okay. Uh, one of his direct descendants is on the board of Preserve Mecklenburg, and huh. I'm going to ask him. He happens to know. But anyway. Now, this house we call it the Noel. You got you got to name a house. And one of the things you do to try to name it is to choose people that were prominent owners. And the first owners, their last name was Knowlton. K N O W L T O N. And the woman who was there, it's not a very good picture of her, and I'm sorry. I just, again, I found her picture in newspapers.com. Her name was Marie um, Nolte. She had a good long life. She lived, uh, she lived, she was born in 1893. And she died in 1990. She's built in that cemetery out there on Central Avenue, right beside her husband. Whatever, I forget what that over there where the, you know what I'm talking about, where the Greek look cemetery is. You know the one I'm talking about. Where it's, uh, you go out Central Avenue, past Eastway, and it's down there on the right. I can't remember. That. Okay, I'm not sure. <laughs> she's very thing. She? I'm sure somebody's smarter than I am about that. He lived, well, she, let's see, 1893, so she, she, was, she, she had a good long life. He lived to be 101 years old. Oh, wow. He was born in 1877, and he died in 1978. Now, let me tell you about the story, because there, there's some real lessons. Let me tell you about Charlotte. 
Charlotte has always been a place, well, always, certainly since the late 1700s. I would say since the cotton gin was invented. Charlotte has always been a place that people like to come to try to make money. I mean, they see it as a place that can really come and get prosperous. Okay. And, you know, that's interesting because people don't realize that some of the richest people in the entire United States lived in Mecklenburg County in the early 1800s. And they lived in Lincoln County in the early 1800s. And they lived in what's now Union County in the early 1800s. And there weren't a lot of them, but there were some really very, very wealthy cotton farmers. I didn't know. And the reason, I mean, the, the number of plant, magnificent plantations in Mecklenburg and Eastern Union and uh, Lincoln County is just staggering. I mean, it's unbelievable how, how grand these magnificent, you know, Joseph Graham's own, the Forney home, Ingleside, Cedar Grove. And the reason was that we had good bottom land along the rivers that were at least accessible to the head of navigation of the rivers. So you can make a lot of money. Well, you know, once people get rich, they like to stay rich. <laughs> and so that's always been Charlotte's one. We want to come here and get rich, make money, get big. And that's exactly what brought Mr. Nolton here. Mr. Nolton, his daddy was, his, I'm sorry, his uncle, I tried to get Mr. Nolan's picture. He graduated from Princeton. So he was he was a he was a wealthy guy. His uncle was the resident superintendent of Mount Vernon. Mm -hmm. Mount Vernon. George, George Washington. Washington's house. There's another one in Rich Dudes. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so he so he grew tobacco. Anyway. So I'm trying to get Mr. Nolton's picture and I contacted Princeton and they oh. were moving the library and they were the myth. I'm gonna get his picture. I'll go back. I'm, it's time for me to go back and get Mr. Nolton's picture. I don't have it. He came here in 1923, moved here from West Virginia. A lot of people moved from West Virginia to Charlotte. You'll find today a lot of people move from West Virginia to Charlotte because he can make a lot more money for the most part in Charlotte than he can in West Virginia. Okay. And he went to work with James B. For who? I can't hear you so well anymore. James yeah. B. There you go. Duke. James B. Duke. James Duke B. Duke. 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 Okay. Duke. Now that's the Riverbend plant there. I don't think the Riverbend plant's there anymore. They got torn down, but. What do you think they burned in that thing to create electric power? I don't know. Coal? Yeah, of course <laughs> they did coal. <laughs> and let, let me tell you what Mr. Dalton's job was. He was the man who bought all the coal for all the electric power plants. Oh, okay. That was a highly responsible job. Okay. He was an avid hiker. He, he was... He was obviously, uh, he was an organic gardener. In fact, when I first went over to the house, I noticed this big garden plot. It was abandoned garden plot in the backyard. And that's obviously where he had his garden. And they lived there from 1929 until 1944. And now she was a she was a formidable person in her own world. She had a degree in interior design, so she really made the house sort of a lavish place. And she did the usual things of 
a tease and socializing and all that. But she was very active in civic life. You know what the Crittenden home was for? Entertaining? No. <laughs> it was a facility for unwed mothers. Oh. <laughs> no, I didn't know that. You know, there have always been unwed mothers, you know. In fact, I wouldn't be yeah. here if there wasn't one specific <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she was the head of the board of directors of Crittenden Homes. In 1939, the voters refused to continue funding the public library. She went berserk, headed a committee they got over 7,000 signatures that required a new vote, organized the voters, and got funding for the, for the, uh, for the, for the public library. <laughs> so she was also very involved in what they used to call the community chest. It's called the United Way today, but they used to call it the community chest. So she was a formidable figure in her own right, okay? She's mm -hmm. buried in that same cemetery out there on Central Avenue that I can't remember the name of. I, I can't and either. Oh, I am 85 years old. What am I supposed to do? So, you see, you can understand why he would want to be able to predict Mr. Moulton would want to have a traditional size home, wouldn't you? Yes. Oh, the resident superintendent, for God's sake, of Mount Vernon. <laughs> Mount Vernon. Okay. As I say, oh, that he, sounds better now. Did you? Is, has your microphone been covered up? What are you doing? I'm covering up anything. I have not done anything. I, I think that you are covering up your microphone. Maybe my paper was covered up. You know, you can hear me. Yes, I I can hear you better now. Don't put your paper okay. over the microphone. I don't want to start over again. No, I'm you not, don't have to start I'm over not again. To start over again. I'm not getting paid anything for this. I, I knew you were going to say that at well, some now, point. Now, uh, uh, well, now, <laughs> here's the real fun part. Now, look. See, a lot of people drive down that high street and see that house. They don't know what uh, Marie Nolan did. They were good Episcopalians, too, by the way, and I'm a great admirer of the Episcopal Church. Grew up in the Episcopal Church. They were St. They were Martin's Episcopal Church, big Episcopalians. Now, this is Victor Shaw. Oh, God, how quick. Victor Shaw was elected. He, he and his wife bought the house in 1944. In 1949, he was elected the mayor of Shaw. He was a, another one of these. He, he was a third generation Shaw. Then he was a natty dresser. See that? See that hanky? See that hanky in his pocket? Yeah. You see that hanky? See it? I, see yes. <laughs> yes, I see the hanky. See that elephant down there? Yes. He's looking at a little toy elephant. And Victor is dreaming. dreaming. I've mentioned this before. By the way, I just got a notice from Zoom that the meeting is going to end in 10 minutes. Because I haven't upgraded. So you have 10 minutes. I'll get done. <laughs> All right, okay. so so uh, you got to upgrade. I, I, before I, next time, I, I will upgrade. I've got an unlimited count. Okay. Anyway, the um, he wanted Shaw to have a zoo. He never could get support for that. That's why he's looking at an elephant. He wanted Shaw to be a big place. He also was the one who got us the Coliseum. You know, they now call it Bojangles. Mm -hmm. All these people go to Bojangles Coliseum. They go to hockey games out there. I saw the Historic Landmarks Commission had a tour. They're going to have a tour of the Coliseum, which I think is great. I'm all for the Historic Landmarks Commission. But they don't have any idea who Victor Shaw was, and it wasn't for Victor Shaw. We wouldn't have the Coliseum. That was the largest unsupported dome in the country when it was um, completed. Was it really? Yes. Okay. Also, his daughter, who lived as a teenager, 
and I did mention this before, his daughter, and by the way, again, just 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 for the just for the word, Shaw was born. Uh, he died in 1966. He was born in 1888. Um, and his daughter's name was Elsie Babbage Shaw. She 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 was a teenager in the house. She's the one that designed the McManaway statue. Oh, Dana, no, are you listening to me? I, I what am. You, what are you doing? Studying your notes? No, no. I, I'm looking. I'm looking at my Zoom account, trying to keep us from getting cut off. So okay. <laughs> just well, continue anyway, on. <laughs> Ignore me. He did. She did the the statue of Hugh McManaway. Well, first of all, most people drive by that statue, which is at the corner of Queens and Providence. And <laughs> Providence. Oh, I can't hear you again. Can you hear me? <laughs> I hear you better. Queens and Providence and Queens and Providence. That's where this thing is. Right? Yes, I am familiar with it. Well, they didn't know who he made way is. They don't know why he's pointing the way he is. I'm not going to get into that. I can't tell everything at once. But it, you look when I look at that house on Mecklenburg Avenue, I see all these stories, Victor Shaw looking at the elephant, wanting the zoo, go by Bojangles Coliseum, we got it because Victor Shaw pushed for it, had a popular referendum that raised the, the public approved the bonds to buy 21 acres of land, which was then available out on Independence Boulevard. A.G. O'Dell Jr. designed the Coliseum. And we got the McManaway statue. Now, let me try to finish up since you got a cheap account. <laughs> now, here's here's the house. Now, Mary Day, let me ask you a question. You're an intelligent woman. Okay. What would you lose if that house got torn down? What would what would I lose? Or well, I mean you'd lose what, the story. What would you lose? I'm, the story? I'm using the general you. I'm not you. What? The what? story? You know, you'd lose. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. you know, one of the things that I always say is, could I take a tour and go in the front yard and tell stories in front of this property? And then it's worth saving. I tell you, this is a this is a house with a great history. It was de it was destined to be torn down. I've gone through this before. It was an historic landmark. If something's just designated an historic landmark, all the owner has to do is tear it down. And we had to find a way to keep that house from being torn down. And there's only one way to do it. That is, you've got to have the owner agree to put an easement on it. Well, right. People will get, listen, I guarantee you right now, if I put these two pictures up, which showing all the infield development, I mean, you look at the pictures. I am. Yes. If we, put, if we put these pictures up, you know, what would some people say? This is showing all its infield development behind the house. Well, they'd be See, upset that the that all that what infield. Would they say? What would they say? What would they say? They'd be upset that all that oh, infill that was there. These developers out coming up, 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 up. Well, the developer, in return for having design-approved infill, is going to put a permanent easement on the house so it will be saved in perpetuity. Yeah, now, that's, that's the payoff. Good. That's the payoff. And, you know, what motivates me? Look, human life. You know, it is so transitory. It is, to use an esoteric word, it is so ephemeral. Right. You know, it, you all these door reporters, even that woman that came to see me, the 27-year-old reporter, oh, it's been upgraded. It's <laughs> unlimited minutes. <laughs> Woo! Woo! See? 
Oh, you're trying to call me out on that. And here I was trying to make it so you wouldn't get cut off. I had to do it on my phone. I think we're good now. What do you think about this way of doing preservation? What do I think about this way of doing preservation? Yes. I think that it is very practical and pragmatic. That's what I think. I just think you wouldn't be able to save as many properties if you didn't do it this way. What? I can't hear you on our unlimited minutes. What? <laughs> No, I still can't really hear you. What? What do you mean you can't? <laughs> I'm just telling you. <laughs> it's not me. I'm sitting there bellowing like an old bull. I can't do it. I know. Well, we'll have to get you better, you know, microphone set up, I think. <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So how much how much was it? One million eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. One million eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Yes. That's now, a lot. Would you think many people would be ready to pay that for it? No. That nineteen twenty eight house. No, not for their personal home. Well, that's right. You have to allow enough infill to generate the income to preserve the house. And again, the reason that I'm so interested in this approach to preservation is because, as you said, it's practical. It works. Everybody comes out a winner. And you've got a permanent easement on that house so that later, after I'm gone, after you're gone, after that 27-year-old reporter that came to see me is gone, that easement will still be put in place to assure at least that that historic home will not be destroyed. And those stories can t still be told and still be active and still be alive. Yeah, I, this, I think that's great. I'm excited to, to see what's happening. When do they expect the infill to be finished, all those houses? Well, they're building them very fast. They're not. They're not building them until they're sold. Mm. And I think they're practically sold out. And by the way, the very same approach is being used on the McNinch House over there on Sharon Lane. And I don't know if you've been by there lately, but man, it no. looks like they're building a rocket launching station there. I mean, they're putting all kinds of new houses up around the McNinch House. Because the same thing has to be done. You've got to make saving these historic resources economically possible. If you don't, you're going to go through the thing. How many times have I seen it? Oh, how terrible. They're going to tear that down. Well, sir, would you like to buy it? Uh, I don't have the money. God bless you every day. I don't have the money either. So what are we going to do? We got to get somebody who's got the money that can make more money by actually saving the house. And that's what this whole approach is about. Yeah. When's it, How old are those pictures? I'm sorry. You might have told me and I was distracted. No, I took these pictures taken in the last couple of months. Okay, so pretty soon. I mean, I didn't take them yesterday. But, right. Uh, and I'll be in. Now, you know, um, Preserve Mecklenburg, this is exactly what we do. Mm hmm And it's a private, non-profit group. You know, organizations like the Landmarks Commission and organizations like the Historic District Commission you know, they just use taxpayers' money. You know, they just you know, just kind of like, it just comes in kind of like the water. Mm -hmm. But we've got to go out there and get the support of the people. So those of you in this community who say you care about preservation, and if you think this is a legitimate approach, 
All you have to do is go to preservebeck.org forward slash donate and give whatever you want and become a supporter of Preserve Mecklenburg because it's the only way this organization is going to be able to live and it's going to be able to thrive. We've got several fascinating projects in the future, and uh, Mary Dana will will we'll have something at some point in the future to talk about again. Yeah, I was going to say we're going to do some more podcasts in the future, right? Yes, and if somebody wants podcasts telling the nice stories about how this was done, I mean, I'm just going to be very much a preservation approach stuff. But what? why am I primarily interested in this? Because it's a way to teach history. Right, absolutely. So, and we're right. We have we have people give us really good suggestions for future episodes of podcasts too. So, thanks everybody for that. And you can always email my dad. His email is danmoral the number two at gmail dot com. Right, and you can follow him on Instagram, Dan Morrill. He is on Instagram. So I think that's about it, Dad. Doesn't that about wrap it up? Absolutely. So thank you I for your to time say. today. Oh, I enjoyed I enjoyed talking to the people. And don't anybody get upset by anything I said because I'm a just opinionated old man and I just say what I think. You are an opinionated old man. That's okay. And yeah, yeah everybody, please give feedback so that my dad will continue to do these podcasts because it, it was not easy. So. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. Thanks, dad. All right. All right. Thanks All right. everybody. Bye.